Isn't it great to be together? <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. We're continuing this series on facets, a dazzling salvation. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, we see it again. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Oh, may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. I hope and I trust that if you're in here today or if you're listening by way of the internet, that you have this living hope, that you have been born again by the Spirit of God, because we're going to talk about that today. I want us to pray. We're in rough waters with this beginning of this series because last week we talked about election, which is something that Christians don't like to talk about often. And today we're going to talk about the new birth, which is another difficult subject to talk about because of the implications of it. And so we're going to graciously move through the scriptures. We're going to look at a bunch of different verses. And we're going to try to piece together this facet of this dazzling salvation. How it begins that God chose us before the foundation of the world, but it moves to this spiritual birth that he's given to us. We're not talking about religion. We're not talking about a creed. We're not talking about a list of do's and don'ts. We're talking about a new kind of life that he's given to us. And I'm so excited to dive into that passage this morning. So let's pray. Father, we do pray that as we open your word, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is willing to put into practice the things that we hear. Give us your wisdom, Lord. Your Spirit wrote these words. Your Spirit breathed life into us. And your Spirit indwells us. And your Spirit helps us to understand the words that you have written. And so, Father, I pray that your Spirit would do his work in our hearts this morning. And I pray that this would be time well spent and that when we rise up from here, we will say, it was good to be in the house of the Lord today. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Just want to mention to you that we're highlighting Black History Month here at Southgate, and every week you'll have a, a new person on the bulletin cover to celebrate what... Uh, some of our African-American brothers and sisters in the Lord have done. And I love this quote from Benjamin E. Mays. He was a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King. He was president of uh, Morehouse College for a number of years, did a lot of great things. I think he even prayed at the benediction at the end of Martin Luther King's speech in Washington, D.C. He says, it isn't more light we need, it isn't more truth, and it isn't more scientific data. It's more Christ, more courage, more spiritual insight to act on the light that we have. I love that. We need courage today, folks. We're living in some interesting times. And the interesting times that we're living in is, fi is finding us in a spot where we don't see much distinction or difference between those who are believers and those who are unbelievers. We don't see much distinction in the way that people live and their priorities and the way that they behave and the things that they do. Barna and Gallup in their polls have discovered by way of survey that there isn't much difference between the way Christians live and the way that non-Christians live. That's problematic. That's problematic because we are called to be holy. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in His sight. That is true, a positional sort of truth that we have before God. We are holy and blameless in His sight, but it also has practical ramifications for the way that we're supposed to live. 
And as we think about that, you know, last week I didn't have time to finish a couple of things, and so I just want to briefly mention these before we dive into the, the new material today. But what are the implications of God choosing us? Now, I, I get that this is, that was a difficult message because we don't like to think about how God chose us. We like to think that, <clears throat> that God looked down and he saw that we would choose him, and on the basis of our choosing him, then he chose us. But that puts salvation in whose hands? It puts salvation in our hands. And Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says it's not anything that we do. It's all by grace. It's unmerited. Romans 3 says there's no one who seeks after God. There's no one who understands. There's nobody searching for the God of the Bible. As much as we might say somebody's on a spiritual quest and we say, man, they're really searching. They're not searching for God. They're searching for their own solutions to their own problems because at the end of the day, we want autonomy. We don't want dependency. And so God couldn't have looked through the corridors of time and saw people that were going to choose him because he tells us in Romans 3 that nobody is seeking after him. And so we begin this amazing, dazzling salvation with the fact that somehow, and we don't totally understand it all, God chose us. That should lead to holiness. That should lead to obedience. It should lead to assurance to know and recognize that we did nothing to get our salvation. So if there's nothing that we can do to get our salvation, then there's nothing that we can do to lose our salvation. And we're going to talk about that more later in another message. But it should also lead to humility because there should not be one of us who says, look at me, I'm a follower of Jesus. It should break our hearts and lead us to genuine humility before the Lord to recognize that unless he chose to intervene in our lives, we would be hopeless and helpless and we would be on our way to hell. And that magnifies the grace of God. He is so amazing in his grace and his kindness and his compassion. And as we think about this whole idea, I love what Thabiti Anyabwile says. I love Thabiti and I love to say his name. Like I, sometimes I'll just sit when I'm studying, I'll be like, Thabiti Anyabwile. I just, ooh, Mufasa, say it again, you know, ooh. <laughs> God saves this way in order to show his glory to the church that he has chosen. Election increases God's glory, and the increase in glory should increase our affection for God. I love that. Now, some might be saying, well, what does this do for evangelism? If God's already chosen, then we don't need to do any evangelism. No, this should fuel evangelism, because evangelism is the means by which the ones God has chosen come to faith. I don't care if you don't believe in election, or if you do believe in election, Romans 10, 17 is true for all of us that faith comes by and hearing by the Word of God or the message of Christ, depending on your translation. We talk about that verse a lot. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you fall down in this camp or this camp theologically. At the end of the day, salvation still happens only when the Word of God is preached. We can't get saved by watching somebody else live the Christian life. Oh, we can say, man, there's something different about them. We can say, wow, look at the way that they make decisions and look at how great their family is and look at this and look at that. And oh my, how can, I don't know how they stand underneath that trial and that difficulty. They can watch us and they can ask questions, but they can't be saved by being a spectator. They can only be saved by hearing the word of God. And this should increase our confidence in evangelism. I love what Juan Sanchez says. He says, The doctrine of election is precious to me because it moves me to make much of God through Christ and little of myself. Oh, we have no grounds for boasting at all before a holy God. We have no grounds of boasting at all before a holy God. And this idea of the spiritual birth, when you accompany it with election, brings a, another sense of great humility and a sense of despair, and throwing our hands up and saying, apart from God doing something, I'm hopeless. And that's the whole point of the gospel, isn't it? The whole point of the gospel is that we do nothing. We can do nothing to impress God. We can do nothing that makes him look down and say, oh, you are so clever. I'm going to give you salvation. Oh, look at how well you do that. Man, that is so good. Here, in light of that, take salvation. 
He looks at us and says, there is nothing you can do, but I'm going to do it for you and I'm going to give it to you. And that is humbling, humiliating, but humiliating in a good sense. I have a sister. She's two years younger than me and same age as as my wife. Um, And when we were young, she was all things girly and all things bright and flashy and glittery. She liked the Miami Dolphins football team, not because she followed football, but because she thought they had the prettiest uniforms. (laughs) And she was a drum major. She was a majorette. She twirled baton. She did competitions at the state level and the national level, and she won hundreds and hundreds of trophies. She was, was very good. Beautiful little short girl, blonde hair, blue eyes. When we stand next to each other, some people are like, how, how does that even, you came out of the same womb, how is that even possible? But one of the things that she loved when we were kids, and it used to irritate me a little bit, she loved the movie Xanadu. Now, I'm going way back to 1980 with that, okay? So some of you are like, Xanadu, what is that? How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say that? Okay, good. Not, 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 too, not too, well, a good number. Okay. So we had, before cable was like a cable, it was like the initial cable thing, before we had like hundreds and hundreds of channels to choose from, we had the three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and then we had this thing that was attached to our TV that brought us this thing called Cineview, and they showed like four movies, and they would have the premiere on Monday night at 9 o'clock, and then that movie would repeat a couple of times during the week, but they didn't show movies all day. They were like specific times, and Xanadu was one of those movies. But over the course of the month and two months, it had this huge rotation where it played often, and then it would play, you know, not so much as it goes on. But we, I'm, I'm pretty sure we watched it like every time it was on. And it's the story about this nightclub and this singer, and Olivia Newton-John was in it, so I was like, okay, I think I'll watch this a little bit. Um, And it had Gene Kelly in it. It was like his last movie, one of the famous dancers and and singers of of Hollywood's golden era. And then some other dude, I think his name was Michael Beck. I don't know what he did before that, and I'm not sure what he did after that. But it was a a fun movie, had a lot of music in it, so I liked it because of the music. The, The plot line in the story was, I mean, it flopped in the box office. But I tell you all of that to say that the opening sequence of this movie was was quite fascinating. Electric Light Orchestra, some of you know who they are, ELO, they sang this song called, I'm Alive. And at the beginning of the movie, you see this mural that's in a city wall, and you see these eight women, I believe, that were on this, this painting on the wall. And I didn't know this as a kid growing up, but they were supposed to be like eight muses from, you know, Greek mythology. And they're all in these poses on the wall. And then ELO's music starts. I'm alive and the world shines on me tonight. You know that song? It sounded very different than that, but it was a, it was a song. <laughs> and as they're singing the song, then all this purple outline of the girls on the wall, all of a sudden they become real. And they step out of the, the wall and they begin to dance and they're dancing around, and they're twirling around. I know everybody's going to be Googling this after church. Don't Google it now, but they'll be Googling it after church. And the song goes on, I'm alive, and the world shines on me today. And it goes on and on. And, you know, if you like ELO, you know, it's good stuff. And as I was watching that as a kid, I was just fascinated that these images on the wall came to life. And years later, after I became a follower of Jesus and was born again into the family of God, I feel like that's a great spiritual analogy of the spiritual birth. Although we're not paintings on a wall, in God's eyes, spiritually, we're as dead as a spiritual, as a painting on the wall. And then God reaches down and he breathes life into us and we're born again. It's interesting in this passage that we started with this morning, in 1 Peter chapter 1, says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. We've got to understand that when it comes to the spiritual birth, the spiritual birth is something that God does. 
we don't do anything for it. Yes, we express faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But it says, He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is this spiritual birth? What does it mean to be born again? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we have covered this ground before, but Elwell's Dictionary of Theology calls it the inner recreating of fallen human nature by the gracious sovereign action of the Holy Spirit. That's a big mouthful. God is recreating our human nature. Ephesians 2 says we were dead in our transgressions and sins, but God made us alive in Christ. I'm alive because God made me alive. Warren Wiersbe has a great definition. He says it's the act of God by which new life is imparted to the person who trusts Christ as a Savior. Regeneration is birth into a brand new life. It is a sharing of the very life of God. And John Piper in his book, Finally Alive, says it's the supernatural creation of spiritual life. If you ever want to read a good book on the exposition of John chapter 3, this book is a, is a great book on that. The supernatural creation of spiritual life. That's the spiritual birth. It's something that God does. I was born at a very young age. I don't know about you guys. And uh, when I was born, I remember it very vividly. It was dark. I was floating. And then all of a sudden, there was a bright light. And then there was a doctor with a mask on, and he smacked me on the backside, and I was alive. Actually, I was alive before that. I was alive in the womb. And there's a whole lot that we could talk about with that right now. But I was alive, but I came out. <laughs> there, it made my, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> made, my, made, my, made my entrance into the world. I was born. But I didn't have any conversation with my parents before that to say, hey, Mom and Dad, you know what? I'd really like to be born to you guys. I'd really like it if you could get together and, you know, do what you're supposed to do and make this happen, and then I'll be born to you, and then you'll be my mom and you'll be my dad, and I'd like to have brown eyes. Uh, I'd like to have brown hair. Um, I didn't choose any of this. I didn't choose anything about my birthday. I was born on November 10th. 1957, and um, I didn't have any say in that. All of a sudden, I'm alive. Is that the same spiritually? That all of a sudden, we were dead, and then we're alive? Did we choose to be alive? Did God choose us to be alive? How does that work? The spiritual birth is an act of God. It's something that He does. He caused us to be born again. If you go over to John chapter 1, uh, very quickly, and look at a verse of Scripture there. In John chapter 1, we have this great passage about Jesus. In verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. And it goes down to say that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And in verse 9 of John chapter 1, it says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now that's where we pause and say, okay, preacher, there it says, we believed. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. But read the next verse. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I am saved through the proclamation of the gospel. I am a dead man while I hear the proclamation of the gospel until the Spirit takes the gospel and opens my eyes and gives me life. I don't respond to it because I'm dead. I am spiritually born at the moment that the Spirit opens my eyes to the truth of the gospel and I recognize it and I put my faith and trust in it. 
And theologians debate this. They call it the ordo salutis, the Latin phrase that means the order of salvation. What is the order? Is it calling? Is it belief? Is it, you know, how do these get in the, in the correct order? And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that, but I just want to say to you, my reason for beginning with election and my reason for going to the spiritual birth is that these are amazing facets of this beautiful diamond of salvation that God has given to us. And these should cause us to weep. These should cause us to have great joy. And they should cause us to be extremely humble because God just looked at us and said, here you go. And all we can say is thank you. All we can say is thank you because we didn't do anything to get it. The spiritual birth, it's God recreating new life in us. It's something that God does, which leads to the question, why is it important? And we know from John chapter 3, when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and came and said, you know, I've heard all these things. What does a man need to do? And Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he shall not what? He won't get into the kingdom of God. It's important because you cannot enter the kingdom of God without the spiritual birth. So Nicodemus says, so can, I, can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb? Can, 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 can I do that? Can I be born again a second time physically? And of course, Jesus wasn't talking about a physical birth. He's talking about a spiritual birth. And, when, and if you jump over to John chapter 3, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's a pretty precarious position that we find ourselves in. That God tells us that we can't enter into his kingdom unless we have something, but this something that we, he says we must have, we are incapable of creating and getting ourselves, which magnifies the grace of God. It magnifies the mercy of God. It magnifies the holiness of God because God just says, here you go. It's necessary because without it, we will not enter the kingdom of God. And it's interesting that Jesus says here in this text, he says, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. This week, I forget what night it was, when we were experiencing the height of the polar vortex. I was told that, what day was it? Wednesday? That Chicago, it was colder in Chicago than it was in Antarctica. That's ridiculous. I thought about, you know, I always wondered how cold it was in Antarctica, and when I heard it was in Chicago, I thought, oh, good, road trip. And then I'm like, nope, I'm okay. I'll just let them, you know, that's okay. But I was sitting, I think I was sitting in bed, getting ready to go to sleep one night, and the wind was just howling. I mean, there were things creaking and, you know, and all these noises outside. I don't know what it's like at your house, but, you know, there's, I don't know, it just sounds like, I can't even describe it, but the wind was just fierce. And when I've, whenever it's been warm outside and there's wind, I like to go out and just kind of look because you can see the trees. And you say, well, now, how do we tell the direction of the wind? You know, I love the professional golfers. They get up there to tee off or to get ready to do a putt, and they take a couple blades of grass, and they go, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> I mean, I do that, and... The ball doesn't go in the hole, so I don't know what the, the point of that is, but they, I'm told they do that to see what direction the wind's blowing. You know, wherever the blade of grass goes, that's where, you know, we sometimes go, try to feel what direction the wind is going. But even when we do those things, we kind of can get a general sense of where the wind is blowing, but we can't see where it comes from. It would be another ridiculous sort of visual to be outside trying to run and find where the source of the wind is. Where is it coming from? Where is it? Oh, it's over here. Oh, no, 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 it's over here. It's over here. And Jesus uses this great metaphor to describe what it's like to be born again because you don't know where it's coming from. All of a sudden, you got it. 
You might be familiar with C.S. Lewis, one of the brilliant minds of the Christian faith who was, grew up sort of Anglican and then left the faith, was an atheist for a number of years, and then he had a conversion experience. And when you talk about his conversion experience, he describes it this way in one of his books. He says he was on, his, on a bus on his way to the zoo, and he said, and on his way to the zoo, he said, I didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. But on the way home, I did. And you're like, what? It was like the light bulbs clicked, and he said, I didn't believe this, now I believe it. When you compare other testimonies of people like an Augustine, Augustine in church history, when he came to faith in Christ, he wrestled with it, and it was emotional, and it was gut-wrenching. And he describes why it was so gut-wrenching, because he loved his sin. And he loved sexual sin specifically. And it was hard, and it was gut-wrenching, and he had this emotional, highly emotional response and conversion to faith. But when you look at the life of C.S. Lewis, and you look at the life of Augustine, you can see those guys they got it because of the way that they lived and the things that they did. It clicked. I don't know what your conversion experience was like. It might have been extremely emotional. It might not have been a whole lot of emotion attached to it, but at the end of the day, it comes down to this. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And when that happens, does it happen before you're born again, or does that happen because you're born again? I think the Scriptures kind of lean to because God has opened your eyes, you're like, boom, I see it. I didn't see it before. Jesus, yes, he is the Son of God. Yes, he is the Savior. And yes, he died for me, and I believe. And oh, what a glorious moment that is when we have that awakening. We were dead. And then all of a sudden, God says, hey, Bobby, come. Oh, what a glorious thing that is. Oh, what a glorious thing that is. You cannot enter the kingdom of God without it, but we can't do anything to get it. But here's how it happens. It happens, and I'm just going to go through these very quickly. It happens by God's choice. We've kind of hammered that enough already. John 1, James 1. It happens through Christ's resurrection. We saw that in verse 3 of 1 Peter that we started with today. It happens through Christ's resurrection. You're born again through that. And it happens through the washing of regeneration, which is really the description of what the new birth is. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, or done, in, done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You were this, but now you're this. You were dead, now you're alive. You were a sinner, now you're a saint. You were driven and controlled by your sinful nature, now God gives you a new nature. Oh, what a glorious transformation that is. What a glorious exchange that is, but it happens through the washing of regeneration. And it also happens through the Word of God. Go down to 1 Peter ch chapter 1, verse 23, and look at what it says here. He says, verse 23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. It ties with Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You were dead, and the Word of God is preached over you, and all of a sudden, I'm alive. I'm alive. And you start dancing with a purple glow around you like in Xanadu, and it's just fantastic, and it's not like that. But, that's, but it is like that. It happens through the hearing of the Word of God. Here's the question that I want us to ponder the most, and man, we're going to have to move quickly through this as well. But what are the results of this new birth? God gives it to us. We were dead. Now we're alive. We have faith in Jesus that we didn't have before. Our sins are forgiven. We have the hope of eternal life. We have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. What 
are the results of the new birth? In other words, what does it look like? I mentioned to you a moment ago about Barna and Gallup and these polls that they have taken where they say that among born-again Christians, there's not much distinction between the way they live and the way that the world lives. Some of their polls say that the divorce rate is higher among Christians than it is in the general population. That Christian young people are almost as sexually promiscuous as non-Christian young people. And the list goes on and on as it relates to alcohol and as it relates to choices and morality and all of these things. And their conclusion is that there's no difference between born-again people and people who aren't born-again. And the way they classify born-again people is by checking a box that says, I have put my faith and trust in Jesus. I've made some kind of a profession of faith in Jesus. And then they go and answer these questions, and the conclusion that Barna and Gallup come to is that there's not much difference between the world and the church. Let's just talk about this for a moment. Have you ever noticed that life looks different than death? Have you ever noticed that? Which tree is the living tree? Or, sorry, which leaf on the screen is the living leaf? The green one. Life looks different than death. Even in the movie Coco, life looks different than death, right? I love the movie. Obviously, I don't believe the theology that's presented in the movie about life after death, but it's a great illustration that life looks different than death. We've been given spiritual life. It should look different than spiritual death that we were walking in before. What are the results of the new birth? Well, number one, we become the children of God. We weren't the children of God, but we become the children of God. And oh, that is a glorious truth. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Second result is that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. And this is one of the verses that kind of is haunting. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. Notice it says, has been born of God, meaning that they were born of God and then they believed in Jesus? I don't know. It's interesting. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. Third result of the new birth is that we love God and obey His commands. And that's what verse 2 of 1 John chapter 5 says. You say that you are a, a born-again follower of Jesus Christ? It should show by the way that you love people, right? That's the result. And, and, and you say, Pastor Bobby, you know, I want you to be careful because I don't want us to go down this road of moralism where we say, and I, I mentioned this last time, and I, and I will try to mention it again and again and again, we can conform our outward behavior to a certain degree and look like a Christian, but still be not a Christian. The changes that, and the results that I'm focusing on are the results that happen when the Spirit of God dwells within us. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. We love God and obey His commandments. We act in a certain way because we've been given a certain quality of life. Number four, we're heirs to an inheritance. We're going to talk about this more as the series goes on, but Titus talks about it. Peter talks about it. Ephesians talks about it. We don't, didn't have the inheritance before salvation, but now we do. And oh, as we think about salvation being a diamond and all these beautiful facets, it's absolutely amazing what God has given to us and the results of the spiritual birth that he's provided for us. Number five, we practice righteousness. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29 says this, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. You know, we're going to talk about adoption in a few weeks as one of the facets of salvation, and it's in the memory verse that we're trying to learn. And adoption is amazing and is wonderful because it gives us all of the rights and the privileges of a son. And we talk about that a lot in our salvation, but we also have to come back to this new birth. We're not only adopted into the family of God, we're born into the family of God. 
And because we are born into the family of God, we possess the character of our Father. And that character begins to manifest itself in the way that we live. And that is such a beautiful, powerful truth. And it results in a practice for righteousness. We don't make sin a regular practice. Yes, we still sin. And 1 John 1, 9 is there. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's uh, work uh, on our behalf through Christ on the cross, it paid for every sin in the past, every sin in the present, and every sin in the future. But when we've been given spiritual life that is life that is the character of God in us, it's no longer the practice and the habitual practice of a believer. That's the result of the new birth. Number seven, we love people. We kind of talked about this already. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and of God. If we don't love people, we have to question whether or not we really have been born again. Number eight, the results of this new birth, we overcome the world. If you've been born of God, you overcome the world. I love what Michael Horton says about this, about Gallup and Barna and these polls. He says, they hand a survey after survey demonstrating that evangelical Christians are as likely to embrace lifestyles every bit as hedonistic, materialistic, self-centered, and sexually immoral as the world in general. That should not be the case, right? And here's what Piper says about this, and I love this. I wish I had thought about this myself first because this is so brilliant. Instead of moving from a profession of faith, which is what the, the surveys did, to the label born again, to the worldliness of these so-called born again people, to the conclusion that the new birth does not radically change people, the New Testament moves the other direction. Think about that for a moment. If there is no discernible difference between the saved and the unsaved, he says they're, they're moving from this premise to the conclusion that the new birth does not radically change people. He says the New Testament goes in the other direction. It moves from the absolute certainty that the new birth radically changes people to the observation that many professing Christians are indeed, as the Barner Group says, not radically changed to the conclusion that they're not born again. I don't want to leave us on that heavy note, but I want to let that hang in the balance because we are living in some very precarious times. And as a pastor, as a shepherd of the church, the under-shepherd to the chief shepherd who is Jesus, I've got to present the truth of God's Word to you. And the truth of God's Word says, if you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And you can't do anything to secure it yourself. But you say, well, preacher, then what are you compelling us to do? Here's what I'm compelling you to do. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Because Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I urge you to do that if you haven't done that. Some of you have been around church your whole life. If you're a college student at Cedarville, you were probably born on Saturday and in church on Sunday. You've heard the gospel, you've heard the gospel, you've heard the gospel. Some of you have been at Southgate for a long, long time. You've heard the gospel, you heard the gospel, you heard the gospel. But has the penny dropped? Have you cried out to God in desperation? recognizing there is no good thing in you, there is nothing in you that will make him want to save you, and you're totally at his mercy, and you cry out to Jesus, and you say, Jesus, save me. Have you done that? If you haven't, believe. Believe. He died on the cross. Believe that. He died as a substitute. Believe that. He died so that sins could be forgiven. Believe that. Cling to that like a drowning man clings to a life preserver. And when you cry out to God, the Scripture says, 
He's not going to cast you out. Believe. And if you haven't done that, I pray that you will. Would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer this morning? Father, the intent of this series is not to create consternation, but to create joy and where needed to create conviction. Because, Lord, at the end of the day, we want to say the things about us that your word says about us. And so, Lord, please work in our hearts. The salvation is so dazzling and so amazing, but as we begin with election, as we begin with regeneration, it feels almost like it's not something very exciting and very dazzling. But both of these magnify your grace to the nth degree that you offer us this salvation through Christ. We just believe. And the belief demonstrates the reality of our birth. Lord, I pray for folks that need to believe in Jesus for salvation. Open their eyes today. Cause them to be born again as they hear this message. And Father, for those who are born again, I pray that these messages would encourage and stir their hearts as we consider this dazzling salvation that you've given to us and that we would walk humbly before you. And Lord, if there's anyone who needs to discuss this, if there's anyone who needs to wrestle with this a little bit more, I pray that as they hear the words of this closing song, that they would come and that they would receive this great salvation. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.